Hello, welcome to this series of videos, which is devoted to an analysis and a better understanding of the Second Vatican Council. In this installment, we're discussing natural law. And according to the Catholic Encyclopedia, natural law is the equivalent to the laws of nature. It's the order that governs the activities of the material universe, and these laws are unchanging. I can't change the laws of physics. There are two reasons this is called natural law. The first reason is that it is set up concretely in our very nature itself. And number two, we know and understand the law through our reason. Natural law differs from divine law, which we're going to discuss in the next installment. Divine law includes precepts that don't arise from the nature of things, but solely from the will of God. And divine law has only been revealed to us through supernatural revelation. Archaeological research shows that even before recorded history, man acted in an altruistic manner at least some occasions and cared for the elderly and infirmed. The first formal conceptualization of natural law probably dates back to the ancient Greeks with the Stoics. Now, if you're familiar with St. Thomas of Aquinas, who it seems we're mentioning pretty much every video lately, uh, he was greatly influenced by Aristotle. Aristotle wrote, Universal law is the law of nature, for there really is, as every one to some extent divines, a natural justice and injustice that is binding on all men, even on those who have made no association or covenant with each other. In Scripture, St. Paul seems to refer to natural law. For when the Gentiles, who have not the law, do by nature those things that are of the law, these having not the law are a law to themselves who show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience bearing witness to them. According to St. Thomas Aquinas, natural law is nothing else than the rational creature's participation in the eternal law. The eternal law he refers to is the divine law. His premise can be summarized that good is to be done and evil is to be avoided. When God created the earth, he created all creatures with a nature, a purpose, and an end. By the end of man, we mean the purpose for which he was created, namely to know, love, and serve God. However, God has granted man free will. We can vary our actions, acts, or abstain from actions as we please. For man is not a lawless being. In the very constitution of our nature, we have a law laid down for us, which is the eternal divine law. And as Paul wrote, it is written on our hearts. Our actions that conform to the natural end are right and morally good as opposed to those at variance with our nature which are considered wrong and immoral. There are three parts to the natural law. The first is the discriminating norm, and this is human nature itself. It's the law, as we said, which is written on our hearts that enables us to determine whether things are good or bad, right or wrong. The second is the binding norm, which is the divine authority that imposes upon us an obligation to live in conformity with the universal order established by God. Because of this we have consciences, and those consciences call us to obey divine authority whether or not we regard that source as being God or not. And the third is the manifesting norm, and that determines the morality of actions through reason. Man has conflicting desires and tendencies, however, and lower desires must be subordinate to the higher ones. For example, to nourish our bodies is a good thing, it's good, but to gluttonously indulge our appetites for food to the detriment of our physical or spiritual health is a bad thing. Another example is self-preservation is a good thing, but to refuse to risk our lives to protect the lives of others is considered wrong. Many things that we consider to be vices are bad because they're either harmful to us, harmful to others, or har harmful to harmonious social life. As we noted earlier, it seems that there's been some sort of concept of the natural law that's existed throughout history, even independent of Christianity. There have been aberrant variations on the theory of natural law, and these aberrations, though, started appearing more frequently after the 1500s. And we're going to discuss why that is in future installments. An example of one of these aberrant theories came from Johann Gottlieb Fichte, who wrote that the supreme obligation is to love yourself above everything and others on account of yourself. The most important person in the whole wide world is you and you hardly even know you. The 
the most important person in the whole wide world is you. Come on, we'll show you. The sign up all about the things you feel and do. Because you're the most important person in the world to you. Jeremy Bentham wrote that the pursuit of utility or temporal pleasure is the foundation of natural law. Mortal sin clouds our ability to discern good and evil. And perhaps it's an indictment of the times in which we live that so many people seem to subscribe to aberrant beliefs of natural law. Perhaps this is because of the pervasiveness of mortal sin. So in summary, the natural law is universal. It applies to the entire human race and is the same for everyone. The natural law is unchanging and it cannot cease to exist. The natural law applies to everyone except perhaps the very young or the mentally disabled, and it commands and forbids in the same manner everywhere and always. We're doing a three-part uh, series on truth, and the next one will be on divine law. From there, we're going to examine dogma and ask whether dogma is eternal, whether dogma is truth, and whether dogma can change. In the meantime, Please pray for the church. And that's okay too.